my job was to make the changes so it could persist another century. And that meant many things I did may not come to fruition on my watch. I was very comfortable with that thought. And I knew some of these it would be short-term pain for very long-term gain. I think the best CEOs wonderfully understand that and they make those decisions in that context. And look, I think about that with technology all the time. And I think it's, I had called it good tech and the essence of every company is that do you manage the upsides and downsides in parallel? Not like, oh, here's all the good, uh-oh, bad stuff too. It's like in parallel, you address both sides of that coin. Welcome to Imposters the show where I have revealing conversations with world-class execs, athletes, and entertainers about their personal challenges and how overcoming those challenges has shaped their careers and lives for the better. I'm your host, Alex Lieberman, co-founder and executive chairman of Morning Brew. My guest today is Ginny Rometty. She is a leader, innovator, and one of the most prominent figures in business today. During her time as CEO of IBM, she transformed the company by embracing growing advanced technologies such as artificial intelligence and quantum computing. But her career would have plenty of peaks and valleys that molded her as a person. Today, Ginny advocates for accessible education and opportunities for underrepresented communities. She's currently the co-chair of 110, an organization committed to hiring and promoting 1 million black Americans into sustaining careers and jobs. Ginny Rometty, thank you so much for joining Imposters. My pleasure to be here with you today, Alex. So let's start at the beginning, like the very beginning. I guess, no, like chapter two in your story. Uh, you grew up with three other siblings. You are the eldest of your siblings. What was the dynamic like between you and your siblings? And did you personally welcome the big sister role? Oh, my goodness. <laughs> well, I am the oldest. And in fact, my brother's only two years younger than me. And then there's a gap and I have two other sisters. Uh, so four of us in total. And I was always and in some ways forced into being the big sister role. I think I uh, enjoyed it naturally and a little bit of a mother hen. In fact, today, my one sister still calls me Mama Bear, actually. Love that. And uh, so to me, they will always be my children, I think. <laughs> um, but it, uh, it probably came full circle, uh, Alex, as you know a little bit of my story, and that when my father left my mother. So when he abandoned our family, my mom found herself with four children. And uh, she was really actually very young, she, at the time, 32. Wow. And, had not gone to college, didn't have any education, uh, had not worked outside the home. And so in order for her to get on her feet, it really meant I had to take on a lot of the parenting duties. So I became sort of the second mother in charge there uh, as they grew up. So first of all, how old were you when your father left your family? I was 16. Okay. And just talk for a second about what that experience was like for you emotionally and how long, if ever, you were able to kind of reconcile your feelings with just the, the, the act of aban abandonment? Well, I, w I was 16. I remember it very vividly, as I talk about it in the book as well, and that um, we had moved into a new home in a little bit safer neighborhood than the one we had lived in. And I had walked into the garage, and my father and mother were talking. They didn't see me walk in. I was just coming in the door. And I heard him say to her, look, um, I don't care anymore. I don't care what happens to you and the kids. You can go and work on the street for all that I care. And those will be the words I will always remember as his last words. And, and he just turned around and walked away and left. And I can remember my mother just standing there. And I didn't see her cry. In fact, my mother rarely cried, right? But that episode and then what would happen after because she said, I have no money. You know, we, we just have this house. I have no money. I can't feed the kids, nothing. And so it meant that we moved to a life of things like food stamps, financial aid, and almost lost our house. I'll come back to that. But uh, in that process, um, I must actually say, out of really terrible things come really valuable lessons. And that probably had the biggest impact on my life in many ways. But uh, there are three things that are really in my head out of this. Um, and I probably crystallized them later in life versus in that moment. But the idea that I watched my mom in the years to follow uh, get enough education to get a little better job, a little bit more education, a little better job, et cetera. And she, I can remember going in a grocery store with her to get food and she had to pay with food stamps. And 
you know, she would prefer to go to a grocery store where maybe no one knew us. Yeah. And, you know, it was really shameful. And, but what it taught me was don't ever let someone else define you. Never. She, like, she was not going to let my dad define her as, um, you know, abandoned or as a divorcee or as a single mother. No way. And so that idea would come into my life many times from both myself, my company. I think it's true for countries. If you don't define yourself, somebody else does it for you. Um, but then two other things. Uh, I say to people, I think it also taught each one. You asked my, my brothers and sisters to start to be fiercely independent, meaning to say, look, I'm never going to rely on another person to be able to take care of myself. I will always be able to take care of myself on my own. And in some ways, that gives you great freedom then because anything you do, who you marry, what you do, you know, if you choose to, it's all on your own terms because you don't need someone f to be able to exist. And so that in independence, it probably is what propelled us all in school because we're like, okay, we're going to get, you know, whatever it takes to get a good job so we can take care of ourselves. And then I think the third thing, which, which is true to this day, not to give you a long answer to that, but is... That's great. Um, it's my first memory of this idea that access and aptitude are not equal. Meaning, like, my mom wasn't dumb. She was actually quite smart. She just didn't have access to education and other things. And so I really realized that that's true for so many people. They have a skill, but they might not have access. And so that... Those are probably three big life lessons, I think, for anybody. And, you know, they actually ended up having a really profound, positive effect on us. Well, I think it's it's amazing the way in which you've taken that early experience in your life. And like you said, it's not something that you have this aha moment when you're 16 and you're in the throes no. of that experience. But, with you know, I think as you kind of reflect on the way that you navigated your career in life, you can kind of hypothesize how these things really had a big impact in the way that you guided yourself, whether it was conscious or not at the time. And so I think it's amazing the, those three lessons you take from it. I actually am interested in how that experience didn't serve you or created issues or challenges in your life that could have held you back if you didn't work on sharpening certain skills in your career or your life because of it. So, you know, I'll, I'll just use the example for myself. I, I look at my experience of losing my dad when I was a junior in college uh, in a similar type of way where I have all these amazing lessons that it gave to me. It, it taught me the importance of grit and perseverance. It taught me about what really is important in life. And at the end of the day, it's like very few things and the things you actually think important aren't very important. And, um, but I also ca can appreciate how it impacted me in not so great ways that I've had to work on over time. Like, my ability to regulate my emotions has been tougher because nothing ever is as profound as the loss of your father. So me actually getting emotive and like crying, I haven't cried in 10 years and I think that's largely a function of that experience. So I'd be interested for you, what are things you've had to work on as a function of that experience? Yeah, that's an interesting question. And I, I, I'm probably not gonna make you happy with the answer because it's a little bit of how I'm wired. It's like I'm always looking at the glass half full yep. out of something. So I don't really, when I think, what did I ever have to really work on out of it that was a negative feeling? Because many people will say to me, did you ever reconcile, you know, how did you deal yeah. with that? And I said, I, I didn't harbor a hatred or it wasn't like that. And I said, I, I really put it aside. And so I think how I learned to handle some of that. So it's, again, the positive side yep. of that. Yeah, yeah, totally. I did learn how to compartmentalize things that, and, and this would come to serve, I was just talking to someone this weekend about that skill who was dealing with the crisis. And I said, look, you, you've taken these actions, you gotta put it in a box, put it aside, and now move on, to the, move on and help the team go to the next step. And this idea that you can compartmentalize and go on to something else. Because in real life, like when you run a big company, I would say crises are like minutes apart. Totally. <laughs> and they're different in between, you know? So I, I feel, that was more what I learned how to do. It, you know, it, it had so many, in the end, probably positive effects. Um, I think just to call that out for a second, I think that's such an important one because I think it's very easy uh, with any, let's call it emotionally provoking experience in life where your emotions become too attached to the decisions that you make after whatever the thing is that happens. And so having an awareness around kind of whatever feelings you may have or the experience you have and finding a way to delineate that from 
how you actually take action in the future, whether it's separating time from it. So by separation of time, you can calm the emotions or just awareness of those emotions and knowing that it could impact your objectivity moving forward. I think that's super powerful as well. Yeah. You know, you, you said something as, as, as you were talking about your own situation, right? And that it, it defined the bar for bad in your life, right? And so it gave you perspective. And I share that feeling with you because no matter how tough something else I would ever face in business, I would say to myself, oh, I've seen bad and this isn't bad. Totally. Okay. When, when, it, when it hits at a core, right? And actually that again turned out to be a positive because I said, you, you'll move through it, right? I mean, that's bad. And I would say to people, if you have your family, you have your health, I mean, okay, you quickly get to the things that are important, right? And, and you're able to move on. And so that's funny, we share that. That's to me like a really valuable perspective because when you see people and, and even yourself, when you're worked up over something, you're like, God, why am I worked up over this? Like, this totally. is not relevant in life, right? Yeah. Oh, I was, I was upset about, I don't remember what it was the other day. It was like, it, it was like a, you know, a service thing somewhere. Yeah, yeah, I'm yeah. getting so mad at the person. I'm thinking, what am I doing? I totally. mean, like, this is crazy, right? This is not, not relevant. What, what I will say is it's always interesting to be, to, to look at what like the yin and yang is of kind of certain mental approaches. So what I mean by that is like, you know, we share this similarity in realizing that any situation we go through, whether it's in career, whether it's in life, as long as it's not something related to like the health of uh, loved ones around us, it, they really aren't big deals. And I've noticed, you know, at least in running my business, that can be, that can serve me really well in having a level head, headedness around compartmentalizing things in a business, never being too rattled. But actually something I've noticed for myself is I have to really work on sometimes urgency because to me, having depth of emotion prompts urgency. You feel like you really need to take care of something immediately or like it, it sometimes it, it creates a feeling of paranoia, which actually can be really good in running a business. And so I think I've actually had to manufacture paranoia so that I don't get complacent. Yeah. Yeah, no, many people have that that particular issue. I mean, it, it, when you say it that way, then I think of things like, because what it made me do was study hard, I had to get yep. forward, but that created perfectionist tendencies in me. Totally. And, you know, so that's something that I had to really work on, right? I can I can remember working with people and uh, in the process, you know, taking the work of the team and I could mark it all up. I mean, even to this day, I can find any, I could find one number wrong in a financial statement. I can zoom and, and there are times I have to say, just because I can find it does not mean I should share it. Totally. I mean, financial yes, but not, <laughs> you know, and, and so I do have to rein in the, at one point, my nickname was Red Pen, you know, like, and I'm like, I okay, love it. all I'm doing is calling out every problem, not, not a positive, right? That you can't motivate a team that way. So totally. it, that clearly did create that tendency. For sure. So I want to talk for a second about education, career, and you know what you before spoke about as kind of a very clear disparity and equity of opportunity as it relates to education and career. You were among the first in your family to go to college, and you know your degree. Uh, I would would assume you you attribute a lot of value to how your degree served you in your career. You you pursued an education in computer science and engineering. It sounds like today, you know, your tune around education is quite different from the start of career, your career. Can you just talk about kind of how your view on the importance of education for career opportunity has evolved over time and why it's evolved in this way? Yes. So it's, it's a great question. And you let me clarify something, because even to this day, I'm a vice chair at Northwestern University where I went. So I still strongly believe in a yep. secondary education, but I believe broadly in this phrase I've tried to coin called skills first, meaning yep. hire people and promote them for their skills, not just their degrees. So that it's a talent strategy. And it comes from that very first seed, you know, now when I reflect back, so revisionist here, um, my mom watching that access and aptitude weren't equal. And then even where I went to college, when I, I could only afford to apply to two colleges, and one was Northwestern, one was University of Illinois. So I was hopeful at a minimum I'd get in a state school and Northwestern was my stretch. They were a school and are to this day a school that says, I'll admit you on your academics, then we'll figure out how to pay for it. Meaning, because I couldn't pay for it. Yep. And so that idea that, okay, it had more about my skill than just my, that I could pay to be here kind of thing. So, so then 
fast forward it, all through my career, I would note, because my career would take many pivots, I was always apprenticing on something. I mean, even when I went to begin um, our consulting business after having been an engineer, yep. I was nervous in that everybody else had an MBA. I didn't. Now, I would go on to lead that business and grow it to $20 billion. I apprenticed, okay? Apparently, I was able to do it without that degree. And then, but as time would go on, when I would become CEO, I would go to hire people. In my very early years, 2012, I was worried about the digital divide and what was happening. Couldn't find cyber people. And stumble, just, just a pure serendipity, walk into another meeting, which is about one school of corporate social responsibility, one high school in a low-income area, where we try a program with a community college, give the kids mentors, offer them internships. Give them, they get associate degree in parallel, no cost, state school. Lo and behold, these kids turn out to be great. great yep. We start hiring them, great employees. Yet 95% of every job I had required a college degree or a PhD. And I started thinking, wait a second, I might have just stumbled on like the super talent pool all underrepresented, by the way, which people say, I can't find underrepresented people to hire. And I'm like, I need them. They're good. I, I, I won't tell you the whole story now, but it would it would start to set in my mind that I start asking questions. Well, how many people do have a college degree in this country? Oh, 65 percent don't. Really? And then as I would w work on and on the heels of the George Floyd murder, how many black people have a college degree? Uh, 20. It's 80 oh percent don't. And you say to yourself, okay, and I am a believer from my history, my family, you can tell it, that if you have some economic opportunity, it's the greatest equalizer, right? Like my education, you said it, was one of those equalizers. It got me a decent job that I yeah. could be independent. And so this became so clear in my mind that, look, this country, we don't have time to, you know, people say, well, send everyone to college. Okay, not only is there not time, mathematically, um, cost, and guess what? I would then learn how many of our jobs are over-credentialed to start. So I'll pause in that my belief is that where you start, okay, maybe you don't have a college degree, does not determine where you end. So it's a really important thought because my experience, like you said, I was first in my, my family. So many of the people now I've watched when they're first, I thought here, okay, I'm gonna hire all these people. It took me five years to re-credential work. They're going to come in at associate degrees. Well, they all go back to school. I mean, once they get a taste and they see it, many. Now, maybe they worked, you know, it worked and went part-time. So I really believe it's a movement for not just the country. I would find this true in like 30 other countries where yeah. I would start these schools. I mean, jobs are the biggest currency in any country you ever go to. If You know, that's why society lets you live totally. there or put your business there, right? So um, I have come full circle on this thought, and it's what I work on today, as you know, in my retirement, is is about placing a million black employees into, the, into upwardly mobile middle-class jobs, but they don't have to have a college degree to start. And I mean, it's really, Alex, it's profound. It, it's logical when you look at how it happened, like post the war, um, the GI Bill, send people to college, it's the American dream. And so I'm not saying, I haven't had to tell many people, I still believe in college, don't say that. But I believe there are many routes and pathways people can take. And so getting people dignity of work and a good job and right now, particularly in a divided country, is like so important that people see there's a future in front of them. So I, I could give a speech on this, no, obviously. No, no, no. But no, I'm I, very passionate about it. And it's led me to skills first. Well, so speaking of being passionate about it, I want you to actually talk more about what you're doing with 110. But I want you to do it in a little uh, circuitous of a way by talking no, about right. the lesson of passion. Um, and you've spoken about this before, but I really think it's a profound lesson that um, I think about a lot that I think anyone in their career should think about. When you were working at GM, I believe as a college student, you realized in that experience the importance of being passionate about what you do. And I, it's funny, I was listening to the talk, uh, talk you gave at, I believe it was uh, the uh, Stanford uh, Business School, and you were talking about how Mary Barra was there at the time and her obsession with automobiles and cars and how maybe that obsession didn't line up with you in the same way. Talk about what brought you to this lesson of passion and how that informed the rest of your career. And then the 1B is 110 with what you're doing with 110. You have the network and the resources to spend your time in any way you would like to spend your time today. What brought you to the passion of solving the problem that 110 is solving 
that makes you think about this and, you know, provide so much of your mental real estate to this one initiative? You know, those are great, great questions for me. And so, um, so when I went to college, I did, uh, after my first two years, I had a professor say to me, look, General Motors is going to interview on campus. Why don't you go? I know, you know, you're taking loans for your education, scholarships. Why don't you go? They're going to hire two people. And uh, they're looking for women in underrepresented minorities, as were the words at the time, and uh, out of the engineering school. Let's go interview. I get this scholarship, and it was a, look, GM doesn't do it anymore. It was called a GM scholar. They paid my tuition at Northwestern. They gave me a job in the summer, seniority, and I did end up going to work for them for the first uh, year plus of my career. Um, so I am extremely grateful to them for what they did for me. And by the way, it's when I met my husband, too. So uh, on one of those internships, who's still my husband. And uh, so, but what I, I learned, I felt like I learned it at such a young age as I look back. Um, I'd been there about a year, and I was working on actually trucks and buses, okay, so not even cars. And uh, I can remember I was doing programming. I was an engineer. It was a great program, great company. Um, and at the time, I thought to myself, geez, I'm not sure I, I like love, or I'm not that excited about a, a bus and a truck. And it's not that that's bad. And I can remember talking to my husband about it. And I said, God, I wish I could do some more problem solving and maybe different industries. And he said, hey, I have a friend whose dad worked for IBM. And, you know, why don't I just call him? And, uh, and Mark, Mark takes credit for my career because of all of these things. And he, he called him and he said, well, go into this interview. But now as I reflect back and, and I look at that whole episode, so why did I leave? I said, really at a young age, I was determining the difference between a job and a career and that a career should have elements that you are passionate about, mm -hmm. right? Like I, I wasn't, and Mary Barr is my great friend to this day. And we're kind of circa, I'm a little older, circa the same. And she's passionate about cars and every kind and really deep in her soul. And I love them to drive it, but it wasn't <laughs> what I could picture doing every day. And I say to her, this is like, I am so grateful to General Motors for what they did for me. But um, I felt, wow, I really learned a lesson. And, and it isn't that you get to do what you're passionate every minute of the day. That's not real life, right? We, we have all parts and moments when we're doing other things. But in the main arc of what you go do, it's really one of my greatest pieces of advice to people that when they go to look for a job, a, never run from something. You always should run to something. And it should be something that, at its heart, uh, maybe it's the purpose of the company, the values, but there is this element that you're really passionate about. And so I was really passionate about applying technology to all these different problems. And I'm like, wow, that's kind of a valuable lesson to have learned at like age 22, yep. right? That this difference was huge. And, and just out of curiosity, uh, I don't know if you can identify this, but something when, when I talk to other entrepreneurs about this idea of, spending time on the stuff that you actually that directionally fills you up a lot of the time how do you actually identify that like how do you know how did you know you weren't passionate about yeah. cars how do you know you're passionate about the work that you did at ibm like is it something you feel in your body is it uh a north star or like a purpose that you just have committed to and you know that any of the work you're doing is in service of that because a lot of people are like i don't know if i'm passionate about anything yeah, that's a very good question. You know how I, I, what I've always thought is, how I've judged it is, it doesn't feel like work to me. Yeah. So I don't dread having to do it. I may mean, dread an assignment or two, but totally. I mean, you, you, you don't feel like it's work. So when people say, oh, why do you do so much of that? I'm like, please, I, I, I do it because I like it, yeah. right? And so that's one way, is this, this feeling that you don't feel like it's work, I think is one way you judge that. Um, the other one is that, you know, whatever you determine is important, which by the way, can be very different for different people, right? Um, that you can see that this is at least directionally uh, supported by that. Totally. And so I don't think it's any more complex. And I also think people shouldn't be like, oh my God, I can't find my perfect thing yet. Um, because I do think it unfolds over time. It, this is a, a really interesting, the difference my husband and I, we were talking about a question I got asked about like, what's the best advice you'd give to someone graduating from college? You know, you speak at a graduation or something. Um, I had one answer and he said, be more patient would be my answer. And he said, I think people need to let stuff unfold over time. They're like such a hurry to get to that ultimate spot. Whereas yeah. sometimes you learn on the road what that is, right? So early in my career, I would learn that. You asked me a question yep. about now late in my career, right? Um, as I was stepping down after my 40 years at IBM, 
and I had a perfect successor ready to go, it, it, and it was the right moment. The company had a good foundation for growth for the future. And I did spend, I didn't spend any time before my retirement to think about what I would do. I think that's very common of people who are so focused. It's like I can't take time to go to another street when I'm on this street. So then here I announced my retirement. I've got to start to think about, well, what am I going to do? And I had many conversations with my, um, one of my great mentors, Lou Gerstner, who ran IBM in the 90s. And Lou would give me homework to go back and think about what did I, what did I really want to do. He would call it the bullseye in where you're going to spend your time. There's something right at that bullseye that is like, not, I won't call it give back. It's like you're passionate. You want to make a difference. You've, here, you've accumulated so much experience. What is it that, and I would come back to Lou and I would say, well, uh, all these different ideas people have about private equity and this and that thing, you know, and you like send me back out with my homework again. And um, to keep thinking, and he knew I was very passionate about education for the reasons we've talked about. And um, there was a triggering point. So back to, do you always know immediately? I don't think so. And it was on the heels of the murder of George Floyd and many businesses, as you know, all you know, what could they do, sort of this reckoning of systemic racism and what could everybody do better. And some people say, oh, I'm going to put money out or, you know, tweet this or that. And I'm a big believer it's actions louder than words. And I had two very good friends, Ken Chenault, Ken Frazier. Uh, Ken had run America Express. Ken Frazier had run Merck, the, or still was running Merck, the drug yeah. company. And I was listening to them. They were, they now are the most senior black leaders in the country. And they said, look, business should do what business does well is give jobs to people. Okay, great vision, and it dawned on me. I'm like, aha, they have the what, I have the how. I know how to do this. Because you can't just give people a job with no skill. That's not what anybody, this isn't meant to be um, charity of any kind. And I said, wait, 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 this idea of skills first. Because so many black Americans do not have a college degree, this is absolutely perfect. And this becomes the how to the what. And, and by the way, I was really aware of the systemic barriers in the country for any group on this topic. And I said, as we knock them down for this group of people, we could go work on black Americans first, first, but actually the barriers apply to everybody. And, you know, we could use our network. So after all those years, you sure have lots of, you know, I hope trust, it, trusted relationships you built. And the key to a skills first hiring world is the employer has to be willing to change. And it's the CEO, it's a really hard thing from my experience to get a company to change because there's so much bias and unconscious bias in a company. And HR has used a college degree to vet most jobs, even the applicants. So that's what it's sort of, that bullseye for me jumped out in the moment to say, wait a second, I, I could, I hope, be part of starting a movement for, or continuing, I think, what we started. Because uh, I'd worked on a decade with the Business Roundtable and other things uh, of a skills first world Yep. Uh, for everyone. So that really became and is the center of my my work to this day. We're going to take a quick break here. But when we come back, you'll hear about Ginny's use of good power, which she defines as being in service of people. Then we get into the biggest lessons Ginny learned during her tenure as CEO at IBM. Stay with us. I'm not perfect. And there's one thing I sometimes struggle with that I think everyone can relate to, and that's asking for help. But asking for help is crucial for success, especially when it comes to big, important tasks like doing your taxes. That's where Tax Act comes in. You can use Tax Act Expert Assist to get unlimited help from experts who can answer all of your important tax questions. Plus, Tax Act guarantees their software is accurate and that you'll get your maximum refund with their $100,000 accuracy and maximum refund guarantees, so it's help you can actually count on. Start doing your taxes and get expert help for free at Tax Act at taxact.com. That's T A X A C T.com. I am always looking for ways to level up my routines. And I just learned about a mind boggling stat about skincare routines specifically 90% of the products go to waste. Yep, almost all of the ingredients in skincare products are either wiped or sweat off before they actually achieve anything. 
Here's the exciting part though. Droplet's patented micro infuser is solving this problem. It's a handheld device that transforms skincare serums into thousands of small high velocity micro drops, allowing the ingredients to absorb into the skin 20 times deeper than topicals. The droplet device works with capsules of different formulas that you can infuse to suit your skin's needs. It's an easy addition to your daily routine that'll give you actual returns. Get 50% off your device at droplet.io and use code imposters. That's D-R-O-P-L-E-T-T-E dot I-O code imposters for 50% off. And we're back. Before the break, Ginny talked about finding her passion during her years at GM. She would then commit her life to removing systemic barriers for underserved populations seeking education or professional development. Coming up, I ask what internal motivation drives Ginny today. One thing I'm curious about because the work that you're doing today, just like the substance of the work looks very different than the context of the work you're doing for 40 years at IBM. I think in both cases, you were led to some degree on the, the spectrum of no passion to 100% passion by a, a great deal of passion. But tell me for a second, how does your motivation look different today? So like when you think about what motivates you to do the work you do with 110, how does the things as you reflect on like what are the what are the 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 drivers of my motivation to the do the work I do with 110 versus the drivers of my motivation with IBM? How do those look the same or different? What comes to mind? This is a very interesting question because to me they are an extension. They are not different at all. And it's it's as I again reflected back to write a book that I thought could be in service of people. It's called yep. Good Power. The three pieces are the power of me, we, and us. And it's actually the principles that I feel as I've looked back now on my working career that are the heart of changing something difficult that I now apply to 110 at scale. So if you think about it, um, in my mind, the very first principle of someone who, you know, again, retrospect, I see. What did the best leaders do to change really hard things? The first principle was you got to be in service of something, not mm -hmm. serve something. And there is such a profound difference. Like, I think you are in service of your audience. You don't just care that we did an interview. You actually care that the listener got something out of this, right? Oh, yeah. And, and you, you prepare, I've told you, you prepare a lot about can I lead them in that spot that then the listeners who you're really caring about got, learned something. Yeah, we're and a vehicle that, for them. Right. And so, you know, like you go to a different a dinner, if the waiter brings your food, okay, that's one thing. If he cared if you had a nice night and made everything else work, that's in service of, right? And so totally. I'm in service of in this role. This is clear to me, right? You're in service of, frankly, multiple, but these all these people that should have a better future. Very simple. The next thing, which is where now I think my work really, trans, you know, marries. And when you say what, how do you apply it? The principle in good power is like, you got to build belief. This is like in spades the issue that's here, which is get companies to under believe in this alternate reality that, hey, I can have a workforce, a great workforce. It's better for my company uh, because of doing this work. And here's the things I have to do. It's like appeal to the heart and the mind uh, yep. at the same time. And then, okay, like any other th tough problem out there, which is what leads me to when you say, what is it different or the same? No, no, very much the same. My whole life I've had to deal with complex problems and break them in pieces, and they are like interrelated systems, which mean, you know, you, got, you can't just fix one thing, you gotta fix all of them, and they interact. Oh boy, talk about changing education and something societal. It is like systems thinking on steroids, okay? So to me, it was like, now, in the process of writing a book, and I reflect back, boy, is there this like really solid line that leads over to where I am. And I think it's true with many people. If, I mean, I had to think about it for two years as I wrote the book, that there's this through line and that I'm trying to convince people, I hope inspire them, maybe convince that, you know, your power to do things, it grows over time and it gets stronger over time. Like yeah. a pebble in water, boom, 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 the ripples. And that's... I feel like if people would just think a moment about what they have learned and could apply, don't give up on solving hard problems because what you learn now is going to allow you to do some of the hard things. Absolutely. 
I'd be remiss to not ask something about IBM, given that you spent 40 years there. It just wouldn't feel right. So to talk about your tenure at IBM, you started working for the company in the 80s, I believe. And yep. there's 81. a pivotal moment in your career where you're deciding to move to the consulting side for IBM, which was a brand new venture for the company. And, you know, you expressed how it's one thing to hook up computers, but entirely different to develop a five-year plan for a business. And I would generally subscribe to the idea that this was a risky move from a career perspective because it was completely off of the management track that you were originally on. Talk about the decision process of going to the consulting side of, of the business and why you took that risk and how important taking that risk was for the rest of your career. That's probably going to be related to the number one piece of advice I could give, you know, people generally, um, because as you just said, I'd been an engineer all my career. Yep. And so when IBM began that consulting business, it was a new area for IBM. It, IBM had services people, but they were more technical. And so this was moving into more business and technology and hired many people from outside. And so I was approached to join them, a few internal people, uh, because I felt like we, you know, they somewhat wanted us to show them the secret maps to understand the place as well. And some of us, they felt, could make this transition. Well, I can remember just churning over this decision because in the firm, as you just said, there have been very clear paths of what are the next thing you go do to keep moving up. And it isn't that I had any great ambition to be the CEO. I just had an ambition to keep doing well. And if you did well in a company like that, which is very um, merit-based, you'll, you know, you'll keep moving forward. And that was fine. And... But I went home and I stewed over this. I can remember it was a Labor Day weekend and my family was around and my husband, I, I kept sleepless nights because I'm going to fail. What if I fail at this? Um, it's completely different. And my husband again would say to me, Jenny, I could, I'm listening to you about what the job is. It's all this problem solving, being logical. Um, seems to me these are like things you do really well, have to communicate. He's like, I think like this doesn't, shouldn't be so hard. And then it dawned on me another kind of, I think, valuable point, which was, hey, at this point in my life, I do understand technology very well, and I know how to work IBM for a client very well, but mm, that's not a very marketable skill, that latter one, and that this is a really externally facing, I mean, clients vote with their dollar. They yep. do or they don't pay for you. So you are worth it or you are not. And I'm like, well, that is the ultimate value of your skill. And uh, so I took a deep breath and... Uh, and finally decided it, but it, it crystal, it didn't crystallize then. It would take another episode. I would go through this again and, and probably continue to crystallize for me that lesson that growth and comfort never coexist. And that actually is, even to this day, I think if I'm not nervous about something, well, that's not very good. That means I'm not learning anything or it's time to move on to something else. But it also was, because I know so many people, and I've talked to so many men, women's groups, and women will say, let me tell you the five reasons I can't do this job. And I mean, I'll say, let me tell you the five I can. And now, I'm not stereotyping. There's studies that talk often about this. And sure. I would say, wait, realize that it's okay to be uncomfortable inside, and I don't always have to say it, <laughs> inside, and that that's very natural. And therefore, get used to that. If you're going to grow, you will be uncomfortable. So and it was a phrase I ended up coining that growth and comfort will never coexist. And it's true for a person, a company, a country. I think it's, I think it's so true. And it's funny. Um, it's something that I felt a ton in my career. And actually the other podcast I do, the crazy ones, which is focused on entrepreneurs and startup founders. I just did a, a 20 minute episode all about imposter syndrome and how to navigate imposter syndrome because I have felt imposter syndrome. I feel to this day now, eight years into Morning Brew, building another business on the side. I, I think about it in the same way as I thought about it when I was in college. And so I just talked about kind of how I've navigated throughout my career. How, how did you do it? How did yeah, you do yeah, it? Yeah, yeah. So there's a few things that I do. One is having an aware... To me, I find talking about things to be cathartic. And so I talk about it. When I talk openly about feeling imposter syndrome, I think it does two things. I actually feel a relief like there's a weight off of my shoulders when I put it out into the world but also then you get the world coming back to you saying oh I feel this I feel this I feel this I feel this so I think that's one of the things is generally people feel 
a gravity around an emotion when they feel an isolation of that emotion. And so when you can understand that people who you look up to in many respects feel it as well, uh, I think there's something calming in that, right? So, you know, it's something that Sheryl Sandberg has talked about openly. It's something that um, the the founder of Atlassian, a multi-billion dollar company, talks about openly. There's a big TED talk he did about it. So that's one. The second is, this is actually, and this doesn't work for everyone, but it's something that I have done actually to work through uh, OCD, which I suffer from. And the the idea is it's called exposure therapy or ERP, exposure response uh, prevention, where you basically, you welcome the, the uncomfortable thoughts and rather than resisting them, say, if, if I was to think to myself, no, I'm a one hit wonder, I'm not gonna be able to build a great second business. I actually think to myself, uh, okay, may, maybe that's true. Maybe I can't build a, a second business. And and I, I rather than if the if there's a pebble going down the river, at, rather than trying to catch that pebble or stop it, I just let it keep flowing. And then the third thing, and it goes to actually the point you just made around growth and comfort uh, can't exist in, in unison with each other. They're mutually exclusive is Jay Shetty, who uh, I, I really think is profound in a lot of the stuff he, stuff he talks about. He, the way he analogizes imposter syndrome is growth-minded individuals have two things. They have skills and they have challenges. And if you are growth-minded, your challenges are always going to exceed your skills. And you feel imposter syndrome when you don't quite have the skills yet to accomplish your challenges. And actually, the reason you're growth-minded is because you want to accumulate skills to meet your challenges. And so if you look at it from that perspective, imposter syndrome is actually an amazing thing. It's a positive signal that you are in search of accomplishing challenges and accumulating skills that allow you to grow. So if you didn't feel imposter syndrome, actually something you should be more concerned about that scenario. I couldn't agree with that more, right? And, and it's funny, I never thought about the word imposter till I went through the book writing process. And people would talk a lot about, well, please write about all the times you felt like an imposter. And I'd yep. be like, okay, I, I I didn't put it in those terms, right? And so I felt exactly what you just described many, many, many times, right? Um, or there'd be times I'd be in positions and I'd say, like, I should pinch myself. Am I actually the one sitting here? And is this, am I doing this or that? But it was always around what you said. It was like you were learning to do something, right? And I think it actually is a really positive thing. So I try to tell people, you know, like you did, just convert that into the flip side. And it goes back to the very first question you asked me. Asked me. I'll sort of flip them always into the other side about what's the positive thing about this, right? Because, again, like the one characteristic I'd hire for these days is people who want to learn. If you're an Olympic learner, and that's exactly what you just described. People who to want to, totally. how do you deal with it is Olympic learning, right? And, and that's like the number one characteristic I'd hire for. Not a degree. I'd hire for Olympic learning. I love that. Yeah, to, to me, the ability to have strong work, work ethic combined with deep critical thinking is like I will hire for that every day of the week above someone who has done the thing and they just pattern match everything. But any new scenario, they can't come to it with fresh eyes. Um, something that's really interesting that you've talked about a lot is this idea that you had no intention of becoming a CEO. Just being focused on the street you were on, doing good work is what got you to the CEO role. Now that you know you're in the in let's call it the next chapter of your career and you can reflect on your time as a CEO, you've had a lot of exposure to other CEOs. What are the most important lessons you learned about what the best CEOs do great? Said differently, CEOs have their attention constantly pulled from their organization and from people. And so prioritization in my mind is the most important thing. What do the best CEOs prioritize? And I have a second question about it, but I want to understand that first. When it comes to being, you know, and I've, I've been able to learn from many, many great CEOs, many great. And I think there's, I'll put two, two big learnings jump on my head when you ask a question like that. Um, I think one has a lot to do with authenticity. And a great phrase I learned from someone, uh, it's actually Napoleon who said it though, is they paint reality and give hope. So the job is not rah, rah, go do something. The job is about really clearly understanding where you are, but then you're able to create followership to go to another place, paying hope. 
I think that's one thing that they do. And then the other thing that you just said was prioritize, but I, w I would put a different, little bit different umbrella over it. I would say uh, the great ones, and I, I write about this as well, is they know what should change, but also what should endure in a company. And I think people forget about the second one often, you know, and even I at times, it was like, change as much as you can. But think of like a tornado with going through and there's, if you're standing there and you're not in a foundation, you get whipsawed everywhere. Yep. And so this idea of knowing what should endure is probably as, as effective a question to ask people and, and get as a CEO in your mind, like, what is it I build from? And that that is like the, um, when the storm goes, it doesn't mean it doesn't have to be modernized, so don't get me wrong. It's not like what don't change, but it's like, what is at the heart a company? What are they at their heart? And really move around that, you know, go from that topic. So I think this idea of what do you change and what should endure, uh, I'm, I'm going to put a third caveat, or third point on yeah. this question, the best ones. It is, you take every, I felt I had learned to do everything for the long term, meaning Especially, it's interesting, the difference between perhaps a founder and someone who's not a founder. I felt I was a steward, meaning, and I don't mean keep it okay and don't change yeah, it, yeah, yeah. but my job was to make the changes so it could persist another century. And that meant many things I did may not come to fruition on my watch. I was very comfortable with that thought. And I knew some of these it would be short-term pain for very long-term gain. And so I think the best CEOs wonderfully understand that and they make those decisions in that context. And look, I think about that with technology all the time. And I think it's, I had called it good tech in the essence of every company is that do you manage the upsides and downsides in parallel? Not like, oh, here's all the good, uh-oh, bad stuff too. It's like in parallel, you address both sides of that coin. With the, the remaining time we have, I have one last question for you. And I don't know if you've been asked this before, but I'm always curious, uh, uh -oh. selfishly, is so you, as you alluded to, you wrote a book, Good, po Good Power, Leading Positive Change in Our Lives, Work, and World. Tell me what you learned about yourself in the book writing process. Because when you spend a shit ton mm -hmm. of time thinking about your entire career, distilling it into lessons in a book, it's a lot of time in your own head. What, what was that process like for you? And did you learn anything interesting about yourself? It was the hardest thing I've ever done next to running IBM. Absolutely. Why? Because to make a book worthwhile, you have to be really vulnerable. And that's a really hard thing to do. And so I, I probably started at one end. I really just wanted to convince people about skills first. <laughs> and I end up with something that's more like a memoir with purpose. It, it's not my whole story. It's not IBM's whole story, but it is the stories that I felt people could learn from because I had to do something authentic to me. So I learned, A, it was very hard. I learned, you know, I hope I learned as best I could to be as, you know, there's probably peaks and valleys of my vulnerability in the book. You know, there are times people wish, oh, I wish it was more. I mean, but I did, the, I did the best I could do on that topic. And the other thing I learned was if you think back on your life, I mean, these aren't coincidences some of what happens. And that's why I think it is actually a really good exercise for people, whether they write a book or not, not at the end of their career, maybe middle, at certain points to just stop and think about, you know, I, I write at the intro to number one, and the first part of the book, I say, who do you see when you close your eyes? And, you know, you'll think of so many people that have had a profound impact on your life and many for things that would be considered small, right? But they chose not to be a bystander to problems. And so I learned about being thankful to all those people. Not that I kind of was, but it really put it forward. And the other thing I learned about myself is I just said there is no surprise now to me that what I am doing right now in this moment, it is a silver thread that has been through my entire that. life of, of teaching and trying to make something better as best I could. It's uh Super interesting. And I feel like, you know, you kind of just showed the tip of the iceberg too. I think there's a fascinating conversation to be had with you on its own about just your relationship with vulnerability and, and kind of how that changed and your awareness around it uh, as you wrote the book. But just to give uh, listeners a little tease and a little incentive to check out the book, what's the most vulnerable thing you talked about in the book? 
Oh, there's there's a good number, but um, probably the decision not to have children um, would be one of them, and probably really disclosing a lot about my family life. Well, um, I'm super grateful for this conversation. Uh, I'm really excited to read the book, and I'm grateful also that, again, you, you spoke about topics that maybe weren't comfortable, but I'm sure, as you mentioned a number of times earlier, have inevitably led to growth because you forced yourself into those areas of discomfort. Ginny Rometty, thank you so much for joining Imposters. Thank you, Alex. My conversation with Ginny Rometty was nothing short of inspirational. Witnessing the exit of her father at the formative age of 16 could have been an experience that diverted her entire life for the worse. Thankfully, seeing her mother bounce back showed Ginny that only you can define yourself, not someone else. For someone to have such an accomplished career, it's so encouraging to know Ginny is still using her influence to make a positive impact on the world. That is the mark of a true leader. If you want to learn more about Ginny's story, her memoir, Good Power, Leading Positive Change in Our Lives, Work, and World, is available in stores now. Thank you guys so much for watching this episode. I hope you enjoyed and I'd love to hear from you. Share in the comments your favorite part of this episode and also what guests you would love to see on Imposters Moving Forward. And finally, like and subscribe so you get content from this show every single week. I'll see you guys next time.